Would you turn back to Genesis chapter 18? While you're turning there, tonight we will observe the Lord's table together. And uh, next Saturday, the Harrys are having a barbecue at their house at 5 o'clock. Everybody's invited. And uh, Paul said, if you have any question, ask a female Harrys, which is all the rest of the Harrys. Um, I've entitled this message, Abraham's Children. Abraham's Children. The title came from verse 19, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after them, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abram that which he hath spoken of him. I told Lynn this morning, I feel like I've never preached a more important message than the one I'm going to bring this morning. I said, I probably shouldn't say that, should I? She said, no, you say that all the time. <laughs> and uh, yes, but I hope I feel that way about every message I preach. I hope I do. I ought to. Uh, Abraham's children. There is no understanding of the New Testament without the Old Testament. Now let me repeat that because in religion, the Old Testament look, is looked at as the old Bible and kind of not, you know, kind of inconsequential. But there is no understanding of the New Testament without the Old Testament. Now, in the passage of Scripture I just read, we are given the nature of justification. Several weeks ago, I said Martin Luther made the statement that a church stands or falls upon justification, and I would agree with that. In this passage of Scripture, we're given the true nature of justification. Now, what do I mean by the nature of of justification. Nature means the basic or inherent features of something, the essential and permanent features of something. Now what does the Bible mean by justification? I hope nobody thinks we already know that. Uh, you don't know it, nor do I know it as well as we ought to know it. What does the Bible mean by justification? When that Guilty, self-condemned publican cried, God be merciful to me, the sinner. And the Lord said, I tell you, that man went down to his house justified rather than the other. What does that mean? Now look back in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. And he, the Lord, counted it to him, Abraham, for righteousness. What does that mean? He counted it to him for righteousness. Now, I want to remind you that the Bible is the inspired word of of God. And God says things precisely and exactly as He intended to say them. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Now, with that in mind, go back to Genesis 18, beginning in verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And he was talking about the destruction of Sodom. He said, am I going to hide that from Abraham? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great nation, a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him. 
that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. This is not, I repeat, this is not about Abraham's excellent parenting skills. It doesn't have anything to do with Abraham's ability as a parent. Perhaps he was a good parent, but if you look at this and then look at the conduct of his physical descendants, <laughs> there's a real disconnect, isn't it? His physical descendants are as a wicked a bunch of people as ever was and as disobedient a bunch of people as ever were. And they hated Christ and they crucified Christ. And there you look through the history of the Old Testament, what an unbelieving, sinful bunch of people, just like me and you. Just like me and you. I'm not getting on the Jews in that sense. They're no different than us. Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. And you cannot look at this and say, well, this is talking about Abraham's parenting skills because that goes against what the Bible says lets us know about Jews and Gentiles and everybody else. Abraham, I hope he was a good parent. And let me say this. this is not, I'm not being dismissive of the importance of being a good parent. You know, we're given specific instructions in the Proverbs and in the New Testament epistles regarding this thing of being a parent. And don't think it's not very important how you, raise your children. Let me read you a passage of scripture from the book of Proverbs. Chapter 13, verse 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him. Early. Be times. Early. Don't think for a second that your parenting is not important. Your parenting will, in many respects, determine how your child is as an adult. Now, I know that scripture says, train up a child in the way he shall go, and in the end he shall not depart from it. And some people think that means if you train up your child in the right way, they'll end up going in the right direction. Now, that's not necessarily so. Uh, what he's saying is if you don't restrain your ch child, if you don't make them do what's right, they'll end up going in a bad direction. That is what that verse of Scripture actually means. But I think of the fifth commandment, honor thy father and mother. Honor thy father and mother. What that's teaching is respecting authority. Yes, you're to honor your mom and dad, but more than anything else, it means you're to teach your children to be respectful to authority. And if you don't do that, you're ensuring that they're going to have a rough life and they're not going to do well in life. They're not going to do well in school. If they have problems with authority, they're not going to do well on the job. They're going to be disrespectful people. They're going to have people disliking them. And it's your fault if you don't train them up to respect authority. I mean, something as um, simple as a, a child acting respectful toward adults. If your child doesn't uh, act respectful for, toward adults, you correct them and you do whatever it needs. Your job, my job as a parent, is to make your kids do what's right. And that's not to be a buddy to them, although I hope you are a buddy, and a friend, but, but more importantly, a parent. You are to make them do what's right. And so in that sense, I'm not dismissing the importance of parenting. But that is not what this passage of Scripture is about. Now, the Lord says in verse 17, And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, why does the Lord say this? Because Abraham was his friend. Abraham 
was the friend of God, the scripture says. And you don't hide things from your friend. You know, if you have a true friend, they've got your back. You don't need to worry about them trying to twist what you're saying and, and distort what you're saying. They've got your back. And Abraham was the friend of God. Turn with me for a moment to John chapter 15. Hold your finger there in Genesis 17 and turn to John 15. Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. The Lord doesn't explain to his servant what he's doing. He doesn't have to. But I've called you friends for all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. Now the Lord has made known that which is altogether important to him, to his friends. If he's revealed the gospel to you, you know what? He counts you his friend. He's let you know the intimate things of his heart, the gospel, the glory of God. Now that is true with regard to every believer. As Abraham was the friend of God, every believer is the friend of God. What a, I think of the Lord spake to Moses face to face as a man speaketh with his friend. What a privilege, what a privilege of grace to actually be the friend of God. And that is a description of every believer, the friend of God. And the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Talking about the destruction of Sodom. We're going to consider that in the next few weeks. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation. Now, I want to remind you that this reference to Abraham's physical descendants is picturing his relationship with his people. It's not just Israel he's talking about. He's talking about all the elect of God, all of those who believe. Galatians 3.29 says, For you are all children of God, all children of God, by faith in Christ Jesus. If ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, Abraham's seed is not the physical nation of Israel. This is talking about the spiritual seed. This is talking about all of God's elect. This is talking about all who believe. Listen to this scripture. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is of the heart and the spirit and not of the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Now, keep your finger there in Genesis 18, and I want you to turn to John 8 for just a moment. You know, so many people, uh, religious people, talk about God having two programs, one for Israel and the other for believers. That's just not so. You can't get that from Scripture. And let me show you this. Look in John chapter 8, verse 36. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now I know, he's speaking to physical Jews, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I've seen with my father, and you do that which you've seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I've heard of God. This did not Abraham. 
you do the deeds of your father. They said unto him, we're not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. You are of your father, the devil. And he says, you claim Abraham's your father, your daddy's the devil, not Abraham. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that's of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we well that thou art a Samaritan and has a devil, you're demon possessed. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There's one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know thou hast a devil. Abraham's dead and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It's my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he's your God. Yet you've not known him, but I know him. If I should say, I know him not, I'd be a liar, like you are. Can you imagine how they felt when he said that? But I know him and keep his sayings. Your, fa your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And they knew exactly what he was saying. I am that I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him. They were going to murder him over this. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Back to our text in Genesis 18. Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, Abraham shall surely, this is for sure, this is not speculation. This is not I hope so. This is for sure. Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation. Now one other scripture. Hold your finger there and once again turn to 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. This is what is being spoken of. 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious. 1 Peter 2, 7. Unto you therefore which believe. He is precious. But unto them which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal generation, priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar, and my marginal reading says a purchased people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now that is the nation Abraham's children shall become. What a nation, a holy nation, every one of them. A purchased people. A chosen generation. The elect of God. This is the nation that Abraham's children will surely 
become. Now, I think this is interesting. Uh, men for centuries think that their ethnicity makes them different than other people and a better and mightier people. And all that is foolishness. All that is is sinfulness. It's base to even think that way. But this nation is different. This nation is God's purchased people. This nation is God's holy people. This nation is God's chosen nation. This is a true kingdom of priests. This nation is different. This is the nation of which Abraham's children will uh, be. Verse 18, Genesis 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, the one we just read about, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. And Paul calls this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, the gospel. Nations shall be blessed. Not maybe or might, but they shall. All of God's elect shall be blessed in him. Now look in verse 19. For I know him. Now in this verse of scripture, we have the true nature of justification. This is what justification means in the Bible. Remember, God says things is exactly as he would have them said. And really, we can't understand the New Testament doctrine of justification apart from this statement. Remember, Genesis is said to be the seed plot of the entire Bible. Every doctrine in the New Testament is found in the book of Genesis. And here we have what justification before God is. Now let's read verse 19. For I know him, that he'll command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. This religious world we live in believes that justification comes as a result of what is called an imputed righteousness. And that word imputed is in the Bible. But do you know the word imputed righteousness is not found in the Bible. Righteousness imputed, imputed or imputation is always a verb. Righteousness imputed, but it is never an adjective. Here's one type of righteousness, imputed righteousness. Now this is the way the religious world looks at justification. It's God uh, giving you an imputed righteousness that gives you a perfect legal standing before God. It's even been called a forensic righteousness relating to the courts of law. You have a legal righteousness because the imputed righteousness of Christ is given to you. You now have a legal standing, a righteousness before the law of God, which is called justification. And here's the way justification is defined, just as if I never Question, what if somebody brutally murdered your child and they're brought before the court and the judge says to that person who murdered your child, I am going to treat you just as if you never sinned. You know what that is? Unjust. That is criminal. So a judge like that, we'd get rid of him, wouldn't we? To treat someone just as if they never sinned. That judge would not be just. And that is what men make justification. An unjust act of God. Him treating you just as if you've never sinned. But look what is said in verse 19, 
I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Now that and nothing less than that is justification. They shall keep the way of the Lord. We're going to consider that's faith in Christ, but it's to do, to do justice and judgment. Now that word justice is the word generally translated righteousness. Only those who are doers of righteousness can be just before God. And the word judgment, they'll do justice and judgment. The word judgment is the legal verdict and sentence of the judge. Justification is not just as if I never sinned. Justification is I never sinned. I have always kept God's law perfectly. I am perfect before God. I have always done that which is right. <laughs> I have a righteous legal standing before God because I have lived righteously. Now, keep listening. Keep listening because somebody's thinking, but I haven't lived righteously. I know you haven't. Keep listening. The only people who are justified are people who have never sinned. God said in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7, I will by no means clear the guilty. Under no circumstance will I ever clear the guilty. This is an absolute prohibition. Under no circumstance will I ever Clear one who is guilty. If I'm cleared by God, it'll only be because I have no guilt. Perfect righteous. Now the only way that the Lord will bring Abraham on that which he's spoken of him. Look in verse 19. I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him to be this um, holy nation, this royal priesthood. Now, God says, I know him. You know, he's the only one that does. I know him. He's going to be righteous. And the only way that can really be understood is where the Lord said in Matthew chapter 3, verse 15, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. You see, when Jesus Christ kept the law, he did it as an us, Abraham and his children. Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, God says, I know him. I know him. You know, in eight other translations, I always look at all the different translations, and eight other translations say, I've chosen him. And one even says, I've singled him out. I've singled him out. This is talking about, and listen to the word very carefully, this is talking about God's discriminating love. Well, that seems like a bad thing. Listen, if God didn't have a discriminating love, me and you'd be in hell. All of us would be in hell. There would be no one saved. I think of what the Lord said through Moses against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast that you may know that the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. If you're saved, God singled you out. God chose you. Somebody says, I don't like that. I do. I do. I, I love it. I love it. 
I know I wouldn't be saved if God didn't choose me. I'd never choose him. Thank God for electing grace. I know him. You know, the Lord's the only one who really knows. He's the only one who knows you. He's the only one who knows me. I know him. And really how the Lord knows is how things really are. I think of that passage of scripture in Colossians 1.22. It says that concerning every believer, they're uh, holy and unblameable, unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now in his sight is how things really are. I know him. I know him. I mean, we are all going through. The, the Lord knows. He knows how things really are. He says with regard to Abraham, I know him. I know him. And here's what he'll do. He'll command his children in his household. You see, salvation is dependent upon the Lord's command. Him commanding me to believe. Causing me to believe. You know, the Lord's commands are never disobeyed. He doesn't say, believe, and somebody says, no. No, if you don't believe, he wasn't speaking to you. Huh. He commands all of his children to believe, and they believe. He causes them to believe. That is the preaching of the gospel. I'm going to command him. I will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice to always do righteousness and judgment that's the, the perfect standing before God that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him now notice he says I'll command his children and his household after him and they shall keep they shall keep the way of the Lord now that's the first time this phrase is used in scripture the way of the Lord now, what is the way of the Lord? I bet a lot of you are thinking, well, what the Lord said it was. I am the way. The truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Now, let's think of that glorious statement that is so infinite that there's no way we could extract everything that's in it. If we had eternity, we couldn't do it, but... Think of what the Lord said, I'm the way. He didn't say, I am a way. He said, I'm the way, the way that excludes all other ways. And if you're in him, you're already there. He's the way to the Father. This is not a journey. You're already there. I am the way. I am the truth. I'm the truth concerning who God is. I'm the truth concerning who you are. I'm the truth concerning God's salvation. I am the truth. Not I'll teach you the truth. Not I'll show you the truth. Not I'll lead you along the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. My life before God is the life of Jesus Christ. His obedience, His perfection, His law keeping. That is my life before God. I am the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. They're going to keep the way of the Lord. And in keeping the way of the Lord, and that's talking about faith in Christ, they do righteously. They do justice and they are justified before me now this is the gospel this is how God saves sinners now in closing let me ask this question I believe all that do you I believe all that but in my experience right now I'm not talking about the way I used to be I'm talking about the way I am right now. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. So how 
can I, without just doing mind games and convincing myself of something that's really not true, how, if I am a sinner, how can I be someone who has always done that which is right, that has never sinned, who the law of God would look me over and say, I find no fault in him. How can that be? Well, it's what the Bible teaches with regard to justification, what we've been talking about, that, that uh, uh, self-condemned publican, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Christ said, I say unto you, that man went down into his house justified, having never sinned, with a perfect standing before God's holy law. How can that be? Number one, justification is by grace. It's the gracious act of God. It is God that justifieth. Who's going to say anything against that? If God does it, it's done. This is the act of God. You know, the judge never, ever says, well, I'm going to give you a choice. Do you want to be justified or condemned? Oh, I think I'll uh, take condemnation. Nobody's going to do that, are they? Uh, but it's not a choice anyway. The, the judge doesn't say, I'm going to give you a choice. He declares you either guilty or not guilty. That is the sentence of the judge. And this is a gracious act of God. If God does it, what are you going to say? <laughs> Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God justified them. Justification by grace. But understand this. Romans 5, 9 says, being now justified by his blood. What that means is this is righteous grace. His blood, the, when, when Christ said, it is finished. Think of those precious words. It is finished. Every one of God's people had, had no sin. He put away that sin. That's why he died. He died because of sin. And when he said it is finished, sin was put away. There is no sin. The reason his body never went through the process of decay is because God was completely satisfied with what he did. Their sin is gone. So I really don't have any sin. Because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ he was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And every believer stands before God without guilt. Justification by grace, justification by blood, justification by faith. What is the evidence? What is the evidence that you stand before God without guilt? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Right now, while I'm talking to you, I fully, well, as much as I can, I don't, I, I don't th th think fully understand is, is the proper language for any sinner to use, but I believe that because of the grace of God, because of the blood of Christ, I'm relying on who he is and what he did as all that's needed to make me perfect before God. Now, understand this about justification, the nature of justification, it's not God treating me as if I had no guilt. I have no guilt. I don't have anything to feel guilty about. I don't have any sin. I stand perfect before God because the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Let's pray.